Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Bridging Chicago podcast. I'm Nathan Shula, your host for today's episode. You can find all five seasons of the podcast at www.bridgingchicago.com and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, where our handle is at Bridging Chicago. Typically here at Bridging Chicago, we interview leaders in the Chicago region. But for today's On the Road series, we are joined by Bernadette Joy, the CEO of Crush for Money Goals, a financial and media company that teaches individuals all over the U.S. how to literally crush their money goals. Bernadette, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited that you're here, that you gave us your time, because I actually met Bernadette at the National Flea Market Association conference that we both spoke at. Uh, in May and uh, in Vegas. And when I heard you speak at NFMA, I thought it was so exciting. And for me to think about being excited, hearing someone talk about money, I never would have thought that before. And so I was like, she must be really good if she can make me excited to, to, to hear about money, to learn about money. So uh, thank you for for, uh, for that. I think you did an awesome job there. Um, but for you, do you have a Chicago story? Do you remember, like, have you been here? Have you visited here? What do you think of Chicago? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for that compliment because <laughs> that's the best thing that anyone can say to me. The main reason I went into personal finance and teaching money was because I found everybody boring. <laughs> so <laughs> if you found what I said, uh, you know, exciting. That that literally makes my whole day. So thank you for that compliment. Yeah. And I will say that I have been to Chicago several times. I have family in Chicago. Um, and I've always loved going to Chicago, Chicago because the city just makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the city planning does not make as much sense. And <laughs> Things in Chicago is pretty easy to find. I definitely love the food scene. I've always been into comedy, and there's so many great comedians. Oh, yeah that have yeah. come out of Chicago. Um, but I am originally from New York City, and I'm a millennial. And so I did not like Chicago as a Knicks fan <laughs> growing up. Um, and, you know, <laughs> like, I, I, you know, now Michael Jordan lives like in my home state, right? So now yeah. I'm like a, a fan of him here. But back then as a 10 year old, Chicago is probably my least favorite, <laughs> my least favorite place as a Knicks yeah. fan. I, I can totally understand that. Um, glad we have that Michael Jordan tie now, at least. Yeah. We all we have to ask you because it's it, New York, you know, pizza. Like, what, what's your thoughts on pizza there? Oh, I just, I, here's the interesting thing. At first, I didn't get Chicago. Like, I just didn't understand it. Like, how is this a yeah. pizza? It just seems like so thick. But yeah, yeah. I love carbs. And so the ratio <laughs> of crust is actually very much in my favor um, yeah. when it comes to pizza so i don't know that i necessarily like one or the other i actually think they're like completely different like i feel like it's yeah. it's like trying to um compare like apples and oranges like chicago pizza and new york pizza i think they're just different and good in their own ways uh, yeah yeah that's a great answer i think um politically it's funny correct. because <laughs> yeah right it's very safe but I, for me it's like people talk about it and i'm like do you know how often i eat chicago style pizza it's like you can't eat that every day. You can't eat that every week. Yeah. <laughs> like, I eat it when people visit because they always want to go, and I use that as my excuse to get it. But, I, you know, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. kind of funny. Uh, I, I was really inspired to hear your story about uh, a lot of things, but especially where you put your, where you put your importance in life and, and sort of why you came to the point of deciding that you were going to retire young and you were going to make life about what you wanted to do instead of what you had to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess let's start there. Like when did money become something for you that was, I'm going to take control of this. I'm not going to let it control me, but I'm going to control m my finances so that I can actually reach my goals. Not someday, but today. That's a great question. So I would say that money has always been uh, an important part of conversation in my family, but very under like smoke and mirrors. So I'm a first yeah. generation Filipino American and uh, I was always told that money was important and you should have a lot of it, but I didn't know how. I didn't know mm -hmm. what to keep it in. I didn't know 
you know, how I could do that, especially as a female, because a lot of the messaging even to me growing up was like, oh, you need to marry someone who has a good job. Right. And one of the things that I one of the things that I always tell people is like, I'm the CEO that my parents wish that I married. Like I'm that person. But no one really gave me that messaging before. And it probably wasn't until um, I was probably a couple years out of school, like four or five years out of school. And I happened I'm 37 years old. I happened to start my career in 2007 in financial services uh, in New York City. And we all know what happened in 2008. And And I was kind of thrown into this situation where I was a 20 something year old that was going around to different offices and laying people off from their jobs. And I was like 22 at the time. And I remember specifically having a conversation and I was flown out to Ohio to tell this entire office that their jobs were all eliminated. And this guy, he looked at me straight in the face and he said, I've been working this company for 20 something years, probably more years than you've been alive. How come you have a job and I don't? And I was like, sir, that's a valid question. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, Here's your severance package. And I remember thinking that day, I said, I said to myself, I never want to be put in that position to be on the other side of the table and not have a clear plan for myself. And I'm not going to rely on anyone else to, you know, create my financial future. So it really started back then. But um, when things started really hitting the rubber was um, after I graduated from my MBA program and I had $72,000 of student loan debt and Mm -hmm. no clear aspirations as to what I was going to do with that. And the original plan that everyone tells you is like, oh, take student loans and, um, you know, pay it off over the course of 10 years. I'm like, that sounds miserable. I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to enjoy my life. And that's when I really started getting serious about learning specific uh, steps towards like, you know, going towards uh, financial independence. You made me think of that movie, Up in the Air. Have you seen that? That was me. That was me. I, I was it's like exactly what I was thinking about when you said that, because I was like, that was George Clooney's role, right? He was just going around all these places and literally just like, hey, guess what? You don't have a job anymore. And then go to the next place. Yeah. Let that movie, I went back in that, back then when people asked me what I did, I would tell people I'm Anna Kendrick from <laughs> Up in the Air. Like I was this okay. 20-something year old that was following this older person just telling people they didn't have a job anymore. And it was surreal. And in a lot of ways, I would say, you know, it was a really, it was tough, right? It was really hard. But Mm -hmm. if I hadn't had that experience, I think my my attitude towards financial independence and relying on other people versus like taking control, like you said, taking control of money would have been very different. So in a lot of ways, I'm grateful that I started off my career that way. Yeah. Can you speak to, I mean, obviously telling something, someone something like that is very difficult. Um, As as that would happen, sort of what would you hear from people about their life literally changing in that moment and the challenge that was coming up of trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces and where to go next? What, What were the reactions of people to that? And sort of did that shape how you worked or how you, I mean, obviously shape your future, but, but in Mm -hmm. what ways did it do that for you? I think that, uh, one of the reasons that I started teaching personal finance was that a lot of personal finance is very much like, you know, there is a certain level of like personal responsibility, but sometimes it goes to the point of like, you know what, the reason that you're, you're, you're broke right now is because it's your fault. Cause you didn't do this. You didn't do that. Or like, you should have known this. And, or you shouldn't be buying, you know, these things that like bring you life. And yeah. that experience in um, having to deliver these really tough messages to people to say, you know what, this stream of income that you've been relying upon for how many years no longer exists. Mm-hmm. Um, and seeing the genuine shock on people's faces mm-hmm. and then followed by fear, yeah. you know, made me realize that the vast majority of people are tr- are doing the best that they can. Right. They're doing the best that they can with what they know. And most people who find themselves and, and I, you know, I think this is where I differ from a lot of people in personal finance. I believe like most people who are having trouble with finances it isn't because they weren't trying. It wasn't because they didn't want to. It's because, you know, the way that we've been taught about things is broken, the way that yeah. we've been communicated. What you know, like, oh, if you just work hard, like that's the ticket. It's we, I think we all know plenty of people who work hard who work really, really hard and still not 
getting as far as they want to, right? And so there's more right. to this puzzle about it. And the biggest piece that I took away from it is having having empathy towards people's individual situations. And I think that's where I have gotten a lot of positive feedback about how I teach money and how it gets people excited because it's not pointing fingers at you and saying, oh, you, you did something wrong here. It's saying, you know what, you've done the best that you could with what you've known until this point. And the future can still be bright. Like it yeah. feels kind of crappy right now, but I was in that spot before. I've been in that spot many times in my life and I still made it out okay. And so I think yeah, there is yeah. hope for you too. Yeah. And and can you speak to education as a resource? Because I think uh, what you do is obviously educating people, but it starts at a very young age, education in general. And not everyone obviously has the same access to the same educational resources. So in your opinion, why is it important that people have access to those things? And then sort of, are there ways that we can help ourselves and our communities have better access to education at all different levels? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, here's the beauty of what education looks like, especially in, in personal finance space versus, you know, how it looked like when I was growing up is financial education is available for everybody right now. As long as you have a phone and can go to YouTube or listen to yeah. podcasts yeah. like this, yeah. right? You can get educated. So much of what I learned about personal finance was me self-teaching by watching YouTube videos and listening to podcasts. Like that's literally mm -hmm. how I first started teaching myself personal finance. But what I think is really challenging for people now is that there's so much information that you don't know who to listen to and you don't know how to decipher what's actually good advice or not. And a lot of people don't know how to apply it to their own personal situation. So some people might see, hear my story and they're saying, well, Bernadette, you're, you're successful because you live in North Carolina versus Chicago or because you're young and I'm older because you don't have kids and I do, right? Um, and what I often have to tell people is, you know, it's not so much the it's not so much the the knowledge that is as important as it is like knowing the right questions to ask mm -hmm. and knowing the questions that are relevant for you, right? And so yeah. finding people who have actually had solutions to the questions that you're asking and actually solve them in a way that seems meaningful to you, not just not just because they actually solve the problem, but they actually were a good person doing it too, I think is very important. Yeah. And when I think about education, um, the simplest thing that I tell people is if, especially in personal finance, if you're going to take money advice from anyone, like have them show you the receipts, like have them show you that they actually have done the thing that you're asking them to do, because there's too many people who are going out and who are well-intentioned, but who are, who, who haven't done the thing that they're teaching you to do. Right. And so yeah. like private yeah, yeah. people. I was, um, you know, I was pitching to a, a local university about transforming their personal finance education, like to make personal finance course mandatory for freshmen coming in. Mm -hmm. And first, and first things first, they were like, oh, I don't know, that seems really like liberal. I'm like, for people to know about money, <laughs> like, oh, what, what, right? And yeah. then it turns out that they did have a personal finance class, but it was taught by a real estate guy who like did it who didn't personally have to deal with some of the things that are you know this generation is challenged with like student loan debt right like credit yeah, card yeah. debt skyrocketing you know cost of living like all of these different things and so when you do get advice because there is plenty there's plenty of people who want to give you advice actually do a little research on the person who's giving you that advice and make sure that they have the credibility to be offering you that education yeah so you're saying it's okay if you have a financial advisor or you have someone that it, you're letting give you advice, educate you, and it just isn't clicking. It just, the personalities don't match. You're just not getting what you want from that. It's okay to move on and say, you know, you're right for someone else, but I need to find someone that's right for me. Oh my God, you have to, you have to advocate for yourself that way, right? Mm -hmm. I will give you a prime example for my own personal life. What, one of the things that, pushed me into doing what I do is I saw, I sought out, I went to go find a financial advisor who was going to help me with, you know, my investments. First of all, there were so many financial advisors who didn't even want to talk to me because they just assumed I didn't have money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. I'm young, Asian and I'm a female and they're like, 
you probably don't even have any money anyway, right? So that was the first thing. Right. And then I finally found someone who was actually going to talk to me. And he just could not answer my questions. And he said to me at one point, he said, you ask really good questions. Nobody else asks me these questions. And I was like, then I don't want to work with you because maybe the other people that you're serving aren't, you know, aren't thinking like I am who want to retire right. at 40 instead of at 65 or who want to be able to be financially independent. People are just handing you over their money and like no questions asked. Like to me, that's not a good relationship. Yeah. But what was like eye opening for me and I thought it was interesting is, you know, I told him, I said, I want to retire by the time I'm 40. And he's like, well, I don't know how to help you with that. And I was like, then why are we here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's OK. You know, and, and I said to him, you know, like that's then I'm going to go find, a, you know, find other solutions to this. So if someone doesn't have, first of all, the solution that you're looking for, then it's time to go. But also if someone isn't treating you with respect to and, and answering your questions um, in a way that's satisfactory for you, that's OK, too. But also, you know, you want uh, I'm. Part of my philosophy around financial independence is one of the biggest reasons I want to be financially independent is because I just want to be surrounded by people that I like. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, you know, like if 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 there's something about the way that you you know handle your stuff, and it doesn't have to be bad or anything, it just it might just not jive with me, right? So, for example, yeah. like I'm the type of person like. You know, I tell my clients like I drive a 2015 Hyundai Sonata, and there's a little gash on the side of it right now because I am pretty terrible driver <laughs> and, <laughs> and people wouldn't look at my car and realize that I'm a millionaire yeah. right but some people like they want the fancy car and that's fine yeah. right then like maybe you take advice from someone who has like the fancy car right mm -hmm. if that fancy car is what you want then I'm not that person and that's okay like there's no there's no harm no foul yeah we have certainly lived in a society where more equals success, right? More money equals more success, more stuff equals more success, mm. more bigger, whatever. That's how we tell if people are successful. But for you, how do you tell if people are successful and what does success look like for you? Like, what are you really focused on to find that success and then to help other people find theirs? I love this question. So I'm going to tell you a, a little tidbit from NFMA from that conference that we both spoke yeah. at. So I had spoken at the conference and afterwards, um, uh, someone came up to me, an older gentleman, and he said, you know, Bernadette, I have, you know, seven businesses. They're all really successful. I love the hustle, you know, and you, but, and, he, and I was like, okay, this guy's richer than I am for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. And so I was like, what? I wonder what kind of question he's going to ask me. And he yeah. asked me, he said, at what, po at what point is it enough? Yeah. And I was like, oh, we're going to get philosophical here today. I like this. I like where we're going with this. And I said, well, let me ask you a question, sir. And I'm like, you know, we just met. Um, I said, why are you asking, why are you asking me this? And he said, well, my, he's like, I'm so successful, but my, my, my wife is mad that I'm not home. Yeah. Right. And I said, okay, let's use that example. Uh, and you know, this can, this can feel morbid to people, but I said, you know, at the end of the day, one day when we all pass and you, you know, you're going to pass one day, like, what would you want your wife to say at your funeral? Is, is she going to say that, wow, you're a great mm -hmm. entrepreneur that you had seven businesses or going to, or do you want her to say something else? And he said, well, I want her to say that I was generous and that I was good to our family. I said, so what do we, do? so then what do we need to do differently? And he, right. and he, right. and he said, he said to me, no one has ever said that to me before. And to me, I think that is the piece that we're missing a lot of times when it comes to that, that definition of success, right. Is qualitatively that's, and that's what I think about for myself at the end of the day, what would I want people to say about me um, as a person? And I actually hope that people don't <laughs> say, oh, wow, she was great at personal finance. I yeah, hope that people yeah. say, "Wow, she she really she really helped me. She really cared about me and my yeah. family. She she was there when I needed her." Right? Those are the things that matter to me. But there is this correlation with finance in order to be that person, right? So part of what I teach in my programs is that there is a net worth and there is self worth, mm -hmm. and it's really hard sometimes to have positive self worth if your net worth doesn't match, right? And right. as an example for, for me, like I've had some tough things that happened in the last couple of years. I had a, you know, my best friend got divorced. My, 
my father passed away, you know, I had my mom had a serious health condition. And, you know, I think me being able to show up was a function of my finances, I could say, you know, like, when, when uh, uh, my friend called me, and she needed me to fly to New York from Charlotte, I was there the next day, because I could afford to do that. And I could take time off of work, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. to show up. For it. And so while when people say, you know, oh, what I care about is being a good person. I don't care about money. We need to care about we need to care about both because yeah. money is just a, it doesn't make you a good person, but it's a tool to help you be there for the people you really want to be with. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. Um, I, I want to pull a little piece out of that something that I was hearing you say, and that is about communication because communication is one of those things, especially when it comes to money. I think most people feel like we're not supposed to talk about that. We're not supposed to ask people about money. And the sad thing is, I think that flows into our relationships, because then when we start a relationship, I feel like it can be really awkward saying like, oh, here's my money situation. When you're starting a partnership with someone or you're talking about getting married to someone and sometimes people don't even know how much debt the other person has or doesn't have or like what they have in savings or any of these kinds of things. So for you, for communication, why is that so important and how do people get over the awkwardness surrounding having those kinds of uh, conversations with people that it really matters to have them with. Oh, I love this question so much because we need to talk more about this. And I would say, especially for communities that don't have that access to that education, right? I was actually just talking to another uh, successful entrepreneur. She also happens to be another woman of color. And she said to me, you know, like, if, if we are not talking about it with our partners or our friends or people that matter to us, like we're going to find that information somewhere else. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're, right. I mean, if we really want it, we're going to find it somewhere else. And so how can we be better stewards of making sure that we're the ones who are educating ourselves and being able to, you know, help other people around us. And I will say personally, I have, I, I actually wrote an article about this um, a couple of weeks ago about just like the tough conversations I've had to have with my in-laws and with my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also with my husband, right. Of like, I would love to tell you like, oh yeah, I just smashed all those conversations and everything went so smoothly. No, like it was terrible. Like some of them are really yeah. awkward. Like some of them got into like fights and stuff. And it inherently what I, t- I, have had to um, kind of retrain myself on, and this is what I train other people to, is that the more that we talk about this and the less scary it becomes, and it's just like any other skill set, any other skill you would expect that you would have to practice a certain amount of time in order to master it. And yet a lot of us are, are talking about finance or treating finance as though it's like, just by like thoughts and prayers, like, I'll hope everything turns out okay versus, wait, let me actually talk about what's going on right now. There might be a different way to do this, or there might be a better way to do this, or I shouldn't be doing this at all. But there is so much emotional charge behind these because a lot of us confuse that net worth and self-worth. It's like, well, if I don't have money, then I don't want you to know that because that somehow makes me a lesser person. Or if I do have, but then also we have this thing, if I have a lot of money, I don't want people to know that I have a lot of money because then they're going to think I'm like snobby or whatever it is. Right. Money is money. Money is yeah. just money. You know, the, the biggest tip that I can give people on how to open up the, de- the door of communication is to find some piece, some area of your finances that you would feel comfortable being transparent about it. And so okay. in my example, you know, I, um, <laughs> my, my father was not very happy about the fact that I was like going out on social media and telling people I had $300,000 of debt. He was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you telling people that you have $300,000 of debt? And what I, t- I showed my father, I showed him all of these different comments that I was getting from people or, or, or um, uh, like emails and stuff from people saying, you know, thank you so much for saying what you said. Like, I feel better about my situation or I learned something from you. And he started to realize, wow, that I thought this would make you look bad. <laughs> But actually, you're opening this door for other people to have this conversation. And then enough, before he passed away, he started sending me like he was 80 something. So he didn't know how to use the Internet. Well, so he would like (laughs) clip articles and like send them to me and say, oh, this this kind of is like something that you said before. Right. So the more that we talk about it, the more it encourages other people to open up about it. So you don't have to be like me and be like, hey, everybody have three hundred thousand dollars of debt. 
but you can tell people, you know what, I'm like, I, I, there's a, I'm not confident right now in, you know, this part of it, or I don't have as much yeah. savings as I would like, or yeah. Yeah. I really want to go on this vacation, but I don't know if I can afford it. Like being a little vulnerable opens up other people to be vulnerable to you. Yeah, it, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your presentation in Vegas was that it was so tangible. You actually had us walk through a sheet of paper that had goals on it and said, okay, what goal are you going to make in this area here right now that you want to look back on, you know, down the road and say, did I meet that goal? So even in that large, larger group setting where it's not a one-on-one -on -one, where it's not, I'm telling you exactly what my financial situation is and what my financial goals are. And then you're saying, here's some possible ways you can get there. But even in that larger group setting, you still were able to give those tangibles of if, if you want to not have to worry about money, whatever that looks like for you, maybe that means that you want to be really generous and you want to start a scholarship fund. Maybe that means that you actually want to have a lot of money and you want to be able to buy a new house and new car or whatever. Um, maybe you have family that you need to take care of. You're worried about parents getting older, whatever the case may be. If you are thinking about money and you don't want to have to worry about it, here are some things that you need to think about and that you need to have answers to so that you can find the right solutions. I felt like those tangible things that we walked away with were so helpful. And I felt like in a lot of situations, we don't always get that. It, it seems to be more philosophical than it is tangible. So for, for people who are wondering, okay, like I, I kind of have a money goal. I kind of know what I want my life to be, to look like, or to be about, um, why are the tangible things important? And then how do they, I guess, how do they get that? How do they, how do they find those things that they can do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you this. I love that you mentioned this, that there, there are so many people who are talking philosophy, right? Yeah. Around, yeah. around money. Here's the thing about money, y'all. Um, there, it's not that complicated. Uh, there's only really two ways to accumulate money. It's to make more or save more. Like that's pretty much it, right? Like make more or spend, you know, spend less, right? Everyone's personal finance philosophy is some variation of that. So mm -hmm. that make more might be, you know, putting into stocks or putting into real estate or like growing your salary or whatever. And the save more might be looking at interest rates or like looking at your grocery bills. But mm -hmm. ultimately it all boils down to, adding more or subtracting more, which is why I always tell people like, as long as you pass fifth grade math, like you'll be, you'll be good. Right. Yeah. So yeah. where I think we've gotten kind of really far away from being able to like make meaningful progress and in individual money goals. And that's what I talked about in that session was, do you have the actual tangible steps that you can do on not even just a daily basis, but I talk about like, are you doing these things in the next 30 days? And where I get people a lot who get overwhelmed is they feel like there's, there should be this checklist that you should be doing every day versus thinking of your, your money more in chunks of time and what you can get accomplished in like a month. And so I really focus people on like, what can you do in the next 30 days? Like if you can get on a budget in the next 30 days, and here's the thing, you don't have to be good at it. Just get it on, get it, get it written down. That is an accomplishment. The vast majority of people yeah. do not have a budget. Do you know how much money you have in your contingency fund? If you don't, go find that out and then figure out how much you need in that. That is a tangible step that most people don't do, right? When I ask people, well, how much do you have in emergency fund? It's always some round number. It's always like, oh, I have this, that, or, or I don't have anything. Yeah. And that already tells me that they didn't really think about their finances because everyone's number should be different because all of our yeah. lives are different, right? Right. right? So why the tangible things are so important is because we can philosophically talk about things all day, but unless we actually take action, nothing's going to happen. And so well, the, you know, the three tangible things that I always tell people like right off the bat when you're looking at your finances is number one, do you have a budget? Number two, do you, are you looking at it at least once a month? Mm -hmm. And then number three, do you have a contingency fund? And if you don't, then what is your, you know, what, what is the amount that you need? You don't even need to have the contingency fund. I just want you to know what amount you need. Yeah. Then it starts the ball rolling of people saying like, okay, now I know where, where my starting point is and I can keep going from there. Yeah. I mean, the simplicity of you either make more or you save more is so crazy to think about because it's like, 
I think it in these terms, let's look at dinner, right? So the easiest thing to do at dinner is to Uber eat something. You, you mm -hmm. do it on your phone, you have them drop it off. So easy. And I feel like, especially in these times, people are Uber eats, door dashing, whatever the case is, they're, oh, yeah. they're having food brought to them because of this, the, the ease of doing that. And, and so it's like, well, I have to eat, right? So I'm going to eat. But then it's like, we don't always realize that if you had gone and picked up that food, it would have cost you five, $10 less than having it delivered. So that's where I see that make more safe more come in. Cause then it's like, well, okay, you, maybe you made enough to cover that cost, mm -hmm. but you're, you're not saving more because you're spending more on getting that item brought to you when you could easily go pick it up or something else up. And so the save more is shrinking um, because we're maybe not using those resources in the wisest way so that money is going out that we don't even really think about because we kind of build that into the I got to eat fund, right? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I, you know, probably the biggest, <laughs> the biggest area I always get people's questions on is like around like, you know, food, right? And people also assume when, especially when I was paying down debt, they're like, oh, you must have been on that like rice and beans kind of situation and you probably weren't eating very well. It's like, no, actually I shop at Whole Foods and I eat, I eat organic grass fed beef and all of that wow. stuff. So you can eat healthy and you can eat well and still be financially responsible. I think to your point, a lot of us trade off like current convenience mm -hmm. versus our long-term like stability and that's where you know and, and here here's the interesting thing i will tell some people like no you know what you should actually uber eat and stuff because you're a terrible cook and you're not going to eat it. <laughs> anyway like i have some friends i'm like you know what you should not be in a kitchen yeah, like yeah. Not, you buy groceries this is all gonna go spoil anyway because you you never do anything with it anyway right so right i think um i think what's more important when people think about it is to your point like they got to eat but how much are you how much are you spending over the course of a month as an example and then yeah you can have some days where you do go eat out uber eats but then something else has got to give if you're going to do that every day right yeah. so yeah. i have i have clients who have like my budget for food every month is between you know 600 to a thousand dollars depending if i'm traveling and that's for two people um mm -hmm. but i have some clients who have budgets for like three thousand or four thousand dollars or whatever a month and that's okay too but then that then the question then is become okay if you decided that you don't want to cook and eating out is important to you then something else has got to give yeah. to make up for that because at, at the at, at the end of the day even the people who are really wealthy like still have a cap on how much they can spend yeah right right so right i think to your point too looking at it in increments of months when it's a few dollars a day, it doesn't really seem like a big deal. But when you add all that together and you look and say, oh, shoot, that eats, equals whatever hundred a month, it's like, then you start to realize this is all money that could have been re reallocated had I not spent it here. And if I'm eating really well and, I, and I'm a foodie, I love food. I love to try different foods from different places. Maybe I can't, you know, I don't have a car, so I can't go 10 miles down the road, which in Chicago is a long way to yeah. get food, but I can have someone bring it to me you know, then maybe that makes sense. And it's okay that you spent that. But if you're someone who's like, I really wish I could do these other things, but I can't because I don't have the money. And then you realize over the course of the month, the, how big that seems, it makes a difference when you're looking at it and those bigger chunks, because then the, the small things don't always tend to add up in our heads that way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I have yet to have a client who actually looked at their budget and, and were like, you know what? I was exactly right. <laughs> Yeah, right yeah. they're always surprised when they see how much they've actually spent on it because the little things do creep up but i would also say on the positive angle of that right like the little things also add up when you do save right so mm -hmm. um i always give people that example of you know a lot i always ask folks you know would ten thousand dollars make a difference in your life and most people would say yes right and um well would ten thousand dollars make a difference in the course of the next year and pe most people would say yes that's like almost a thousand dollars a month, right? That would yeah, make a difference yeah. in people's finances. But if you break down $10,000 over the course of 365 days, that's $27 and 40 cents. Hmm. And so if you're someone who is, you know, smart enough or resourceful enough or creative enough, or just, you know, motivated enough to figure out, well, how can I make 
an extra $27 or 40 cents or save 27, 40 cents a day, that's $10,000, yeah. you know, over the course yeah. of a year. And for some people like that $27, it might literally be Uber Eats, right? Like it might yeah. be Uber Eats, but it might be, you know, choosing, you know, like for, for me and my husband, some of the things that we, you know, decided that we didn't value as much as like, you know, I used to love clothes, like, and I still do, but I don't spend as much on clothes now, right? I spend yeah. it on other things or, you know, deciding to, even if we do eat out, like we'll share something versus each get each of us getting our own meal, right? So there's a lot of creative ways that people can come up with that are small that will also add up in the opposite direction in a positive way if you just, if you decide to commit yourself to that. Yeah. Uh, our, our time's running out and um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I'd like for you to, to end on this note because something you've kind of said throughout is, you know, you don't have to be perfect at this to, to do something. And so I kind of want to end on a, on a hopefully a more optimistic note of like, how do we give ourselves grace in this process? Because if we, if we do something and then we feel like we're still not being successful, how do you, why is it important to give yourself grace as you go through the process of learning about how to handle your money? I am so glad that you were ending on this topic because I think it's super important. Where I see a lot of people give up on their finances is because they try something once or twice and then they say it didn't work and then they just <laughs> move on, right? Yeah. And yeah. there is such a strong association with money and math. So people assume there's like a right way and a wrong way and it should be fairly quick. When actually the analogy that I give people is that learning how to become good with money is more like learning music. Like if you wanted to learn piano, if you wanted to learn guitar, most people would agree that it would be kind of un unreasonable to expect after picking up a guitar once or twice that you're going to suddenly learn how to play a song, right? right? So when I tell people when they are working on their finances, yeah, if, and this is the other piece I would say, and I think it goes back to some things that we talked about, like, what would you say to your your niece or your nephew or your son or your or a kid a 10 year old kid if they picked up a guitar and then they made a couple of mistakes in the song you'd say wow you still did a great job like keep going like yeah, you're yeah, doing yeah. really good but for some reason we don't do that for ourselves so yeah. i really love that you are bringing up this point because in learning money in order to be good at it you will you have to make mistakes if you're not making mistakes that means you're actually not taking very much risk and um, I actually wrote a column for a time. It's called Mess to Million. And I decided to take the approach of instead of saying, oh, look how great I did in all these things. I wrote about everything I messed up, like everything yeah. I messed up, and like what I learned from it instead. And um, and the only reason I was able to get a million was because I messed up so many times I knew not to do those things again. So yeah. if you have made mistakes in the past before, give yourself some grace today. Know that you're going to make mistakes with money going forward. That is just the name of the game. Uh, and if you can't, if you're not in a place yet where you're, you're that person that can give yourself that grace, like find someone who is supportive and who wants to see you succeed and let that person be that mirror that you need. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, really good stuff. And I think hopefully really encouraging stuff for people as they look to start work or continue work on their money goals. Um, we always like to end up obviously with uh, having you share how people can reach out to you because I'm sure people are going to want to know how they can connect with you. So can you share with us how to connect with you and if people want to learn more? Sure. So I am primarily on Instagram. If you want to see me on a daily basis, I post money tips all the time. I'm at Bernadette Joy spelled with the word debt in it. Oh, and, good. uh, and my website is crushyourmoneygoals.com. Uh, and if you head to the website, there is a free guide there for anyone who wants um, 30 ways that you can start working on your finances today after listening to this, this episode. And, um, and there are particular things that I have used personally to get my finances in order. Yeah, we will be sure to uh, tag all those in uh, this episode so that people can um, connect with you. Thanks again for your time, Bernadette. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And of course, we want to thank our listening, our listeners for tuning in to this episode of the Bridging Chicago podcast. Again, you can find our socials on Twitter, 
and Instagram, where our handle is at Bridging Chicago, on LinkedIn by searching Bridging Chicago or by going to www.bridgingchicago.com. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bridging Chicago as produced by the SATC Solutions Center. Nothing contained in this podcast shall constitute financial, investment, legal, and or professional advice. No professional relationship of any kind is created between you and the podcast host or guest. You are urged to speak with your financial, investment, or legal advisors before making any investment or legal decisions. Furthermore, the opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the opinions of SATC Solutions Center, SATC Law, or any of its employees. This podcast is created by the hosts and guests' individual capacities. All opinions on this podcast are or have been rendered based on specific facts under certain conditions and are subject to certain assumptions and may not and should not be used or relied upon for any other purpose, including but not limited to or use in or in connection with any investment purposes or legal proceeding.